Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining uh, me today. Uh, before I turn to the substance of today's publication, I will comment uh, very briefly on the Chancellor's statement. Uh, firstly, and perhaps most importantly, I very much hope that for the sake of people's mortgages and living standards, uh, the statement from the Chancellor earlier will deliver uh, some stability in the market. However, to say that this is now a UK Government and a Prime Minister without a shred of credibility is an understatement. Indeed, it is perhaps a sign of how badly broken UK politics is that the Prime Minister's resignation has not already been tendered. I also reflect as First Minister that if I had given in to demands made by Tories and indeed some commentators on the day of the mini-budget to match the UK government's tax plans, I too today would be dealing with something of a financial disaster. It should, I think, be a relief to everyone across Scotland that the Scottish government did not act so rashly. It will also be galling, I think, that the one measure that the Prime Minister has repeatedly cited to effectively justify the market turmoil of recent weeks, the energy price cap, has also now been curtailed, uh, leaving many people and possibly many businesses without the support with energy bills that they were before today expecting. Uh, there's no doubt this is a self-inflicted crisis for Liz Truss, and it is uh, humiliating in a quite unprecedented unpre way uh, in terms of the climb down. Uh, I think the sooner uh, this Prime Minister and indeed this entire government departs office, the better that will be for everyone. Uh, let me turn now to something that I hope is more optimistic in laying out an alternative for Scotland. Now, I have a lot of detail that I want to cover today, so I would ask uh, people, particularly the journalists in the room, to bear with me once I have finished speaking. However, uh, I will give every uh, journalist in the room uh, who wants to uh, the opportunity to ask a question. Um, in today's paper, uh, we make the economic case uh, for independence. Uh, fundamentally, we argue in this paper that a stronger, fairer, more sustainable economy is more possible for Scotland with independence than it ever will be with continued Westminster control. By combining Scotland's many economic strengths and abundant resources, particularly our vast renewable energy potential, with the policy levers that come with independence, an economic model built on social partnership and good, stable governance, we can build a well-being economy that works for all. We also address in this paper key questions on currency, fiscal sustainability and trade, and I'll say more on these topics shortly. In 2014, the choice before the Scottish people was framed by Westminster parties as the strength and stability of the UK on the one hand and the uncertainty of independence on the other. The reality in the years since has been very different. It is glaringly obvious now that the UK does not offer economic strength and stability or financial security. On top of an already crippling cost of living crisis, calamitous decisions in recent weeks taken by a government Scotland did not vote for have sent mortgage rates through the roof and brought pension funds to the brink of collapse. It is now very clear that we also now face another round of austerity cuts that will damage our public services, perhaps existentially, push more people into poverty, and further shred the safety net that is so essential to any decent society. So that is the so-called certainty that continued Westminster governance now offers us. And while recent events have brought this into sharper focus, this is a crisis long in the making, and it is not a temporary phenomenon. The UK economy is in long-term decline. The UK economic model is failing and failing badly. The facts speak for themselves. The UK is poorer than many of its international competitors. Indeed, as the first paper in this series demonstrated, it is substantially poorer 
than independent European countries comparable to Scotland. It has lower national income per head, wider inequality, higher rates of child and pensioner poverty and lower productivity. More and more, the UK looks like an outlier in economic policies, performance and social outcomes. Brexit, of course, has turbocharged these trends. Over time and compared with EU membership, Brexit will wipe billions of pounds from the Scottish economy and the tax revenues that support public services. Yet, inexplicably, all the main Westminster parties now back it. There is no route for Scotland as part of the UK back to the EU or to the single market or customs union. If we stay as we are as part of the Westminster system, the outlook for Scotland is this. Austerity, low growth, wages and living standards stagnant at best, high and growing inequality, rising rates of poverty, economic damage, reduced trade and narrowed horizons as a result of Brexit. And all of it exacerbated by increasingly dysfunctional Westminster decision making. The price of this for people across Scotland will be heavy. However, I know that there are many people who, even though they agree with that analysis, still have big and fair questions about independence. Questions like, why now in these tough times? Is a stronger, fairer economy really possible with independence? What currency will we use? How will we deal with any debt and deficit we inherit? How can we protect trade across the UK if we are back in the EU? This paper addresses these questions openly and frankly. First, why now? Uh, there is an understandable human instinct to hunker down in the face of a storm and hope for calmer times. But for the UK, this is not just a passing storm. The UK economy is fundamentally on the wrong path. And there is no real alternative on offer within the Westminster system. The establishment consensus on Brexit, despite the harm it is causing, illustrates that. For Scotland, not being independent means we are being dragged down the wrong path to a path people here did not vote for. To build a more stable, sustainable economy with fairness and human well-being at heart, independence is essential. And that's the fundamental point we make in this paper. Independence is not an abstract argument separate from people's daily lives. It has at its heart the ambition and crucially it equips us with the essential tools to build a fairer, wealthier, greener, happier country. I know, however, that it's not enough to show that the UK economic model is failing, even though it demonstrably is. We must demonstrate that independence offers a better alternative. Now, independence is not a medical cure. There are no guarantees of economic success for any country. For Scotland, like every other independent nation, our success will depend on the quality of the decisions we take. It will be hard work. But this paper sets out the reasons for believing that we can succeed. After all, we know that for other independent countries of our size or smaller, independence already works. Why would it not for Scotland, especially as we have so many economic strengths that many of them don't? Vast renewable energy resources, internationally competitive industries from food and drink to technology, from tourism to life sciences and the space sector, more world-class universities proportionately than almost any other country on the planet, a creative, skilled and highly educated population. The policy tools we get with independence will allow us to make the most of these strengths. As in any democracy, different governments will make different choices. But in this paper, we set out some of the opportunities that the economic powers of independence will open for us. For example, with powers to reform the energy market, we could ensure that our renewable resources deliver security of supply and lower costs while also tackling the climate emergency. We could ensure fairer work, European-style labour market policies in place of Westminster anti-trade union laws can bring government, business and trade unions together in a social partnership underpinned by greater worker involvement and stronger collective bargaining. 
This is the kind of approach increasingly championed by organisations like the OECD as the best route to high wage, productive economies that are sustainable and more inclusive. With employment law powers, we could do more to tackle the gender pay gap and age discrimination, ensuring, for example, that young people receive the same minimum wage rate as everyone else. It is an approach based on human well-being, lifting people up so that they can contribute fully, not waiting for wealth to trickle down while the inequality gap grows. With independence, we can rejoin the EU and be back inside the world's biggest trading bloc. As an EU member state in our own right, we would, for the first time, be in a position not just to benefit from EU trade deals, but help shape them. We would have an immigration policy tailored to our needs, and we would have the stability of knowing that the governments making the decisions that shape our economy have actually been elected by us. These are just some of the opportunities independence would open up. Another overarching question I know people have, though, is this one. How do we get from here to there? In this paper, we take that head on. As the events of recent weeks have indeed underlined, whether we like it or not, fiscal credibility and market confidence are essential to the well-being and living standards of all of us. That understanding is central to the approaches we set out. Firstly, we describe in this paper the new financial institutions that will be required to help ensure such credibility and confidence. On that, though, it's worth noting that we are so much more advanced than in 2014. Back then, Scotland didn't have its own tax or social security agencies. We do now. Indeed, there have surely been few, if any, nations in history better prepared for independence than we are. To add to those institutions already in place, we would create an independent Scottish central bank, a debt management office, and significantly strengthen the Scottish Fiscal Commission so that it effectively replicates the Office for Budget Responsibility. These institutions would operate independently of government and help ensure financial stability, transparent economic forecasting and performance monitoring, and a responsible, purposeful and efficient use of borrowing powers. Second, we address the issue of currency. We confirm that the policy of the Scottish Government is to establish a Scottish pound. We would seek to do this as soon as practicable. The precise timing would be determined not by a fixed timetable, but by a set of objective requirements and criteria, guided by advice from the Central Bank and subject to a decision by Parliament in the overall interests of the country. This paper sets out in detail a careful and responsible phased approach, as well as the arrangements necessary to support a new currency and, in the shorter term, our continued use of sterling. The paper also sets out the approach we would take to securing fiscal sustainability. Again, this recognises the vital importance of confidence and credibility in public finances. The deficit and debt an independent Scotland will start out with will be derived from and influenced by the overall UK position. In the case of debt, it will also be determined by negotiations that follow a vote for independence. As was established in 2014, Scotland would not have legal responsibility for UK debt. We do, however, in my view, bear a moral responsibility. In light of that, and indeed our desire for strong future partnership between Scottish and UK governments, we would seek a fair settlement on both debt and assets. Now, given the turmoil engulfing the UK's finances at this time, it is not possible to make an estimate of our starting fiscal position, though the IFS has suggested that in 2022-23, Scotland's deficit is likely to be similar to or lower than the UK's. We do confirm that we would set clear fiscal rules uh, to put and keep public finances on a sustainable path. We would intend these to align with the broad principles of the European Growth and Stability Pact, which is currently being reformed. We intend to have fiscal rules that keep day-to-day -day spending within sustainable limits and debt on a sustainable path, but still permit governments to properly support public services and borrow to invest. We reject austerity as both morally wrong 
and economically counterproductive. Further, we do not accept that austerity is necessary in a country as wealthy as Scotland and with our abundance of resources. It is ultimately the creation of a sustainable, inclusive economy that delivers fiscal sustainability. Neither austerity nor tax cuts for the wealthiest will deliver that. It will come instead from investment in people and infrastructure. That is why we propose in this paper the Building a New Scotland Fund. Oil and gas is a declining asset, and our obligation to the planet means that we must move away from fossil fuels as quickly as possible. But oil and gas can't be switched off overnight, so Scotland could benefit from these revenues for some time yet. If we invest remaining oil revenues and use our new borrowing powers responsibly and for a purpose, we can invest up to £20 billion in the first decade of independence. This investment will help accelerate the transition to net zero and transform communities. And crucially, it will help kickstart the inclusive growth that will help get our newly independent nation on a fiscally sustainable path while building the fair society we all want. Lastly, uh, the paper considers the issue of borders uh, and trade, although we will publish a further paper later in this series specifically on European Union issues. Uh, there are two important points to underline at the outset. Firstly, independence opens the door to Scotland rejoining the EU and the single market. That will allow us to grow and diversify our trade in the way Ireland did after joining the EU. Trade across the UK is important, but that must not be the limit of our ambition, not when we have a market seven times the size of the UK on our doorstep. Second, Scotland will remain in the common travel area with the rest of the UK and Ireland. That means any talk of passports to visit relatives in England is utter nonsense. Free movement of people across our islands will continue as before, an independent Scotland, though, back in the EU will also regain free movement across 27 other countries. What Brexit does mean, though, when Scotland returns to the EU, is that border arrangements will be required to ensure continued trade in goods and services across the UK. None of this, none of this is insurmountable, but it does require proper planning. Most of Scotland's trade with the rest of the UK is in services, and we set out the arrangements that will need to be in place to ensure that continues. As far as manufactured goods are concerned, the things that actually physically cross borders, we actually export more to the rest of the world than to the rest of the UK. Nevertheless, we set out here the mechanisms by which necessary checks can be carried out in a way that allows smooth trade to continue and makes clear that we would provide support to traders to adapt. It is important to note that for the purposes of this paper, we assume that the UK-EU relationship will be governed uh, in the longer term by the current trade and cooperation agreement. However, over time, it is possible that economic reality, if not common sense, will lead the UK to greater alignment with the single market and to agreements that reduce the requirement for checks. Now, in the time available to me today, and thank you uh, for bearing with me, I've only been able to summarise this paper. I encourage everyone with an interest to read it in full. It can be accessed at gov.scot forward slash New Scotland. In the coming weeks and months, we will publish further papers on EU membership, energy, pensions and social security, for example. Uh, today, though, marks a milestone in the conversation about how we can build a better Scotland. Uh, and that kind of optimism, I think, is very necessary at this time. There can't be many, if any, who look at Westminster right now and think that this is as good as it gets. But in relation to an independent Scotland, people want to know. Indeed, people have a right to know this. Can we do better? Do we know how to do it and will it be worth it? I believe with the right vision and a lot of hard work, the emphatic answer to all of these questions is yes. And this paper sets out the how and the why. Uh, thank you all very much indeed uh, for listening. Um, I will now uh, go to questions. Uh, what I'm going to do is just uh,
go through the list of journalists I have in front of me here right now. I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot, though, so anybody who doesn't want to ask a question, feel free to say so. Uh, but I will uh, go through everybody on the list so that everybody gets the opportunity. Uh, and I will start with Lindsay Bewes from the BBC. Lindsay. Thanks, Westminster. Um, you've obviously set out uh, some of the detail of your economic proposals for independence today in this paper, but do you accept that for voters looking at this document, there's still a great deal of uncertainty because a lot of this would be subject to negotiations. For example, EU membership requires the agreement of the EU and a trade border with the rest of the UK would be subject to negotiations with the rest of the UK. Uh, no, I, I do um, accept that we will have a requirement um, to continue to provide information and to update information as circumstances change and uh, some respect circumstances uh, over which we have no control, the turmoil in the UK right now, as we uh, progress towards uh, a choice on independence. And we will seek to do that as fully um, as we possibly can. Uh, just as uh, we did in 2014, uh, we will endeavour, and I think it's really important, that we set out uh, as much information as we possibly can. And that's what the series of papers is seeking uh, to do. And, uh, you know, if you take Europe, for example, there will be a paper, as I said, I think a moment ago, dedicated to issues around European membership. Yes, there will be a process of negotiation that is required there, but nobody uh, with any credibility seriously suggests that Scotland would not be welcome back into the European Union. And while there would be a process of negotiation, uh, most uh, people who know what they're talking about on this issue uh, are very clear that that would not be uh, a particularly lengthy uh, process. But these are issues that we will continue to update and inform people on. Uh, the last thing I would say, though, is we will also be candid uh, with people that there is an inherent uncertainty in the future for everybody, for every individual, family, business and country. There are some questions that uh, no country can answer definitively uh, because it depends on circumstances and the, the decisions that are taken. Um, and that comes back to an essential point here. Uh, this is not a choice, as it was often framed as in 2014, between certainty on the one hand and uncertainty on the other hand. The future is inherently uncertain. The question for Scotland is how do we best navigate that uncertainty? Uh, and I think that's with governments that we vote for rather than governments that we don't vote for pursuing an economic policy based on the values uh, of the majority in our country and harnessing the power of our abundant resources. Um, independence is not a guarantee of success, as I've said, for any country. But having the powers, the levers, the decision making in your own hands, whether you're a, an individual or a nation, better equips you to face up to uh, challenges than allowing other people to take decisions for you. Uh, James Cook. Thank you, First Minister. Clearly, your argument is that the current situation with the Scottish economy is unsustainable and you want to transform the economy in an independent Scotland. But the current situation, as your paper accepts, involves a huge gap between tax revenue and public spending, nearly £24 billion, much, much higher than the UK average. If you're honest with the voters, as I'm sure you want to be, is it not simply a fact that the first years, perhaps even the first decades of an independent Scotland, would require tax rises, spending cuts, vast and expensive borrowing, or a combination of all of those? Well, let me seek to answer that question candidly. Um, and I did uh, reference the need uh, for borrowing um, in uh, the early years, certainly. But most uh, governments in uh, developed countries borrow uh, all of the time for investment and also to you know, cover gaps uh, in uh, between their, their revenues and their expenditure. And most countries in the developed world have, have deficits. Now, in terms of Scotland's position and, and Scotland's current position, um, of course, is a reflection of Westminster governance, not uh, a reflection of, of life in an independent Scotland. But nevertheless, the position we inherit is the one we will uh, have to manage. Uh, one of the points I, I made um, in my opening uh, address is that uh, although we are not seeking, given the turmoil in UK finances right now, to estimate at this stage what the opening position 
would be, uh, and we will potentially update on that, it, should it be possible, in the months to come. Uh, but the current uh, estimate uh, of the Institute for uh, Fiscal Studies is that the next JERS uh, publication, which will cover uh, this financial year, will actually show Scotland's deficit similar to or potentially lower than the UK's. You and I that know is that oil. That, that is the current high oil, oil price. And, and wasn't that the mistake you made in 2014, was, so, was, was looking at that? I, I think if you had not interrupted me, you would have found that was actually going to be the next words out of my mouth. Sometimes uh, not interrupting gets you further than interrupting, <laughs> James. Um, so that is to do with the, the oil revenues. But therein lies the choice. Because of that, what we are describing here as a windfall, oil and gas, as we have learned in previous years, is a volatile asset. And as we look ahead, put aside the, the, the price of oil, there are other factors, not least the maturity of the North Sea Basin, that means that is a declining resource. So if we take that windfall opportunity to invest in infrastructure, not only can we accelerate the transition to net zero, but we can kickstart the kind of growth that helps us much more than making cuts or increasing taxes would do to grow the economy and over the medium term, get our finances onto a, a sustainable path. But that's the path. point, the medium-term, First Minister, isn't it? But it, it? You can't have it both ways. You can't invest those, that money in an oil fund I'm not to help the economy to... in the long term and also say that there won't be tax rises or spending cuts I'm not trying. or expensive borrowing. Well, I'm just I, asking you, I, will there not be those things in the yeah. short to medium You find, if I'm able to speak, you get better answers than if you just keep talking over me. Um, I am not trying to say we will do both. So as we use oil revenues to invest, to kickstart growth, which increases the revenues in our economy, day-to-day -day public spending uh, will operate within the fiscal rules we set. And these fiscal rules, as they are with any country, is not about delivering budget balance immediately. It's about delivering budget balance over a period of time. And if you grow revenues, that gets you to that, I think, in a better and more sustainable way and in a way that is better for for society than the alternatives you talk about. So for any country, it is about that balance. We are setting out here how we think we can achieve that balance in a better way. And incidentally, because this goes to the heart of your question that I'd have got to quicker had you not interrupted me twice. <laughs> I'm only teasing. Um, I, I, I'm only teasing, uh, but we've got lots of questions. I, I am accountable, which is why I'm going to stand here until every journalist in this room has got the chance to answer a question, unlike some. Um, but the, the, the treatment of oil revenues in that way, so taking them out of day-to-day -day spending, is actually better for overall sustainability, because you're not allowing your day-to-day -day spending to be dependent on a volatile resource. Is this an easy path for any country right now? And deficits have grown across most countries because of the pandemic. Is this an easy path for any country? No, but it is one that we are able, doing it this way, to guide through a sensible approach consistent with our values. Right now, we are facing another period of a UK government trying to balance the books on the back of the poorest in society uh, through austerity cuts that the Chancellor has just said this morning are coming down the track. So these are about choices. You're absolutely right about that. But we are making different choices and independence is essential to allow us to implement very different choices. Anyway, thank you for that interaction. <laughs> Ewan Petrie from STV. Thank you, First Minister. I know you said you would say more on pensions at a later date, but I, I wonder it's a, it's a big, big issue for a lot of businesses, a lot of individuals. So at this stage, can you tell us who will take on the liability for paying those pensions and how that would work? Uh, the Scottish Government, we said that in 2014, I have said that in recent months in the context of another choice on independence, the Scottish Government will be responsible uh, for paying uh, the pensions uh, of uh, those with uh, state pensions in an independent Scotland, either uh, those who have that uh, when the, we become independent and for those who become uh, entitled to a pension uh, later on. As with all sorts of things, there will be a negotiation about accumulated assets and debt that will take account of you know, the, the sort of funding of pensions over the, the past. But the responsibility for pensions will be the Scottish Government. So incidentally, um, and GERS, uh, which I know everybody's very fond of the GERS publication, uh, bears this out. Even if you exclude oil revenues from Scotland's balance sheet, uh, the 
uh, revenue that we currently uh, raise in Scotland is already sufficient to cover all day-to-day -day devolved expenditure, all social security expenditure, including the state pensions. So uh, we will set out uh, more detail on pensions, which will uh, cover the state pension, but also the arrangements for uh, private uh, pensions later in this series. The last point I would make on this, though, is you know, we, we hear and heard in 2014 a lot of scare stories about a lot of things, uh, and pensions was one of those. It is not because Scotland has been independent that pension funds in the last two weeks have been brought to the brink of collapse. Uh, that has been entirely down to a UK government taking calamitous decisions uh, and actually getting away from UK governments we don't vote for taking calamitous decisions is actually one of the arguments for Scotland being independent. Uh, Amelia, uh, Jenny from Channel 4. Amelia. Um, Hi. Hi. Uh, First Minister, if, as you say, you were to rejoin the EU, do you accept that means a customs border with the rest of the UK? And that will inevitably cause massive disruption to Scottish trade? Um, so I accept uh, the premise of the first part of your question. I don't accept the, the second part. And actually, I, I set that out in, in summary in my opening remarks, um, and it's set out in more detail in this paper. Firstly, if Scotland rejoins the EU, of course, uh, we are regaining access to the single market, which is seven times the size of the UK market. And we are uh, regaining access to customs free trade across the entirety of the customs union. That is a massive advantage. Um, and if you look at, and I'm not suggesting that Scotland would automatically emulate the experience of any other country, uh, we have to take our own decisions and earn our own success. But just as an illustration, if you look at the experience of the Republic of Ireland uh, when it joined uh, the EU back in the, uh, the 70s, it uh, massively diversifies its trade away from uh, what at that time was uh, substantial reliance on the UK market uh, towards the European Union. So there's an opportunity for us to diversify trade. What I set out in my remarks and what is covered in detail in the paper is that the decision of the UK to be out of the European Union, if Scotland is back in it, does mean there is a requirement uh, for arrangements to be put in place to ensure the continued uh, trade between Scotland and the rest of the UK, which is important. Uh, we look separately at services and goods in this paper. Most of Scotland's trade uh, with the rest of the UK is in services. Some service sectors are not subject to UK or EU uh, regulation, so would continue uh, as is, business training, management consultancy, for example. Uh, other parts of the service sector uh, we would uh, require in the current arrangements allow individual EU states to have bilateral arrangements with the, the UK, uh, and we would seek to do that. With goods, uh, manufactured goods, we actually export more to the rest of the world than to the, the UK, which is why getting back into that single market is important. But we would uh, learn from international uh, best practice uh, that right now, if you look at Norway, Sweden, for example, the use of technology to ensure uh, that these arrangements were implemented in a way that did not disrupt trade between Scotland and the rest of the UK. Again, I'm not standing here saying all of that is without challenge, or all of it is, is always straightforward and easy. Uh, but it is not, these challenges are not insurmountable if we do the proper thinking, analysis and planning, which is what we kick off with this paper today. Uh, Peter Smith from ITV. Oh, no, sorry, my apologies, Peter. Uh, Ivor Bennett from Sky. I've just missed one. <laughs> Thank you, First Minister. Um, despite the details of this, these proposals, as you say, um, they are just proposals, so you'd still be asking voters to take a huge gamble in the event of another independence referendum. So why do you think they would do so and back independence, given that the economic outlook now is so much more uncertain than it, than it was back in 2014 and the last vote? Look, I accept, I have always accepted that uh, the, the job for those of us who believe that independence is the better future for Scotland is to persuade people of that. We've come a, a long way in that task, but I accept we're, we're not there yet. That's why we are uh, furnishing people and will continue to furnish people with as much detail as possible and be candid about the, uh, the areas where either because of the inherent uncertainty of life, we cannot give uh, definite uh, answers or where certain 
uh, matters depend on negotiation, uh, as will be the case for many countries in many different circumstances. Uh, in my view, and I think this is a view uh, probably held by an increasing number of people, given not just recent events, but the longer term trends of the UK economy, is the gamble for Scotland is not becoming uh, independent. The gamble for Scotland would be staying part of a Westminster system that is you know, engulfing all of us in financial turmoil right now, is seeing mortgage rates go up and, and uh, harming people's living standards. But the long term trends uh, are negative as well. Uh, so this is about how we equip ourselves with the tools that independence would give us in order to make more of our massive resources. Independence works for you know, countries across the world, many of the most successful independent countries in the world don't have the kind of resources Scotland has. That doesn't miraculously mean it will suddenly be a success, but it should give all of us confidence that there's no inherent reason why Scotland can't make a success of being an independent country. And now, as built, Peter, uh, Peter, I was about to go to Peter McMahon. Peter Smith from ITV News. That would have been really, really bad for me. Yeah. Um, just um, first question, not against you, Peter, by the way, but uh, uh, I couldn't possibly comment. No, no, just, out uh, of that one. just being prepared so much and then let down. Um, <laughs> but the um, get, look, the proposal, your your idea of proposing to continue to use the pound is the point at which an independent Scotland would be most vulnerable. It's been described as like living in a brand new house with no house insurance and you have no control over the, your interest rates. And interestingly, much of your economic case is built on the, the opportunities when you rejoin the EU, um, but you can't do that while you're using the currency of a non-member mm. state. Uh, that's, well, there are responsibilities on new members to, to fall in line with um, fiscal and economic policies of the EU, and you wouldn't be able to do that if you don't have either the euro or your own currency and control over those aspects and those, those levers. So um, what I'm interested in asking First Minister is, how long would Scotland continue to operate in that vulnerable, vulnerable position using the currency of another country? So uh, firstly, I would never knowingly let you down, Peter, so I just want to make that clear. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll move on to your questions. Um, in, in terms of just as a, a as an aside, it's an important aside, but I don't want to get sidetracked. On the EU point, uh, where you know, the, the point you are making is a legitimate one, but there is nothing that would stop an independent Scotland or any country applying to join or, or rejoin, in our case, the EU uh, before we have our own cu currency. Clearly, the negotiation around rejoining and the process of establishing our own cu currency uh, would be processes that we would want to align. But the idea that we would have to have our own currency before we start that process of re-entry to the EU is not uh, the case. In terms of the, the more substantive... It's control over the levers which part of your currency would... Yeah, but, but we can get that process underway and then we have a process in which we would be uh, re-establishing membership of the European Union while we were going through the process that I'm going to come on to. Look, you need to, and if I was to say anything else, you would rightly say that I was being unrealistic. If I was to say, and, and there are, there are uh, people in my uh, own side of this debate who would love me to stand up and say, on day one of independence, we will suddenly have our own currency. Uh, that is not possible. Uh, we need to make a transition uh, to, from where we are to having our own currency, and that is what we set out. Now, during that period, when we continue to use sterling, which we are free to do because it's an internationally traded currency, it doesn't depend on uh, agreement with the UK, we would be in a position of our monetary policy uh, still being governed by the Bank of England. Now, that, for a transitionary period, is necessary. But we do not consider that that is a sensible position longer term, which is why uh, we are stating the policy of moving to a separate currency as soon as practicable. Now, why don't we put a particular time scale on that? Uh, because we consider that that would be uh, not responsible because one of the criteria for the exact time at which that move is made would be the overall economic conditions. And therefore, if you tie yourself into a specific time scale, you could end up trying to do it at a time that would not be optimal. So instead, and I appreciate you haven't had the chance to look at this in detail, we set out uh, requirements and criteria that would guide that process. 
uh, together with advice from the central bank and ultimately a decision of the, the Scottish Parliament. But because of what you have uh, outlined there in terms of that period where we'd be using sterling, we would want that period to be as short as practicable. First Minister, I'm just trying to get the people you know, want information mm -hmm. and they want this. Is, you've, you've spent a long time building up to this publication and you still can't say, are we talking two years, five years, ten years, realistically? Also, I just would like to ask you, First Minister, um, People will, I mean, the, the independence case in 2014 was many people would say won and lost on the independence case for the economics of an independent Scotland. People can now see what your plan would be for the economics of an independent Scotland. And you are determined to let the people of Scotland have their say either in a referendum or a de facto referendum. If they reject it, will you concede defeat on this point and would you resign? <laughs> but I, I'm, I think, reasonably um, standing here putting a proposition uh, forward. And as you rightly say, allowing people uh, to uh, look at the detail um, and, and come to a view. I, I think that is the, the fair and reasonable way to proceed. I've uh, already uh, been asked and, and made comment on, you know, what happens to me. This is not about me. Uh, and, uh, but I'm, I'm not predicating this uh, on, on failure. I'm predicating this on successfully making a case to the people of Scotland, particularly, not entirely, but particularly given the alternative uh, of continuing part of a dysfunctional UK economy, that we make the positive choice to be independent. And, you know, I am confident that at the next time of asking, the people of Scotland will choose that. Um, and if the alternative turns out to be the case, uh, then you'll have the opportunity to ask me uh, about that at the time. Uh, and now, uh, Peter McMahon from ITV Border. You never get too many Peters, First Minister. Well, I, I should probably say there are, can never be too many Peters. Uh, and those uh, who understand uh, <laughs> why I say that. Uh, First Minister, you've said that uh, you want an independent Scotland to rejoin the EU. You've also assumed in this paper that it's likely the rest of the United Kingdom will not be in the EU, and therefore you've conceded there will be trade borders. Now, your paper says here any actual physical checks would likely be only undertaken on the two main trunk roads between England and Scotland or at rail freight terminals. Could you say what those main roads are, the M6, the A1, I presume? And also, given that uh, someone like Professor Nicola McEwen has identified there's 154 kilometres of border, 25 crossing routes roughly, mostly minor routes, but crossing routes nonetheless, how would you avoid, if there are trade barriers, people avoiding trade and effectively smuggling across the border? Um, before I go into that, I just want to uh, amend one of my, my previous uh, asides to you. There is actually only one Peter uh, that matters uh, to me, which I think is the important thing uh, to say. Um, look, we, well, not to try and dodge a question, but I've said we will publish further uh, detail ar around European Union issues. So some of these issues we will develop further from uh, what is in this paper. Uh, so in terms of the road you talk about, yes, uh, and we are being candid here about the implications of Scotland being back in the EU when the rest of the UK, wrongly in my view, is out. That is a, a feature of Brexit and the benefits Scotland gets from that, in my view, outweigh the challenges that we would face. We would, and the paper goes into some of the detail on this, uh, we would, uh, as many other countries already do, I've used the example of Norway, Sweden, increasingly use technology uh, to, to do this. Um, and, you know, these are... Are these uh, you know, challenges that we wish we didn't have? Yes, but that is, if we want to be back in the EU with all of the benefits, many benefits that come from that, we have to overcome these challenges. It is possible to do, in my view, with proper planning and being open and candid with people as we will be But there will be the border checks on the England-Scotland border. I, we will have to have arrangements in place for the uh, transport of goods. I've already set out the difference between services and, and physical manufactured uh, goods. But let's not lose sight of the two things. Firstly, with proper planning, uh, the ability to do that in a way that doesn't uh, disrupt trade. Trade between Scotland and England is important. Trade between England and Scotland is important to England. Uh, but that should not be the limit of our ambitions. We have a market seven times the size of the UK's uh, on our doorstep, and we should be seeking to put arrangements in place that allow trade across uh, that. That is 
uh, the, the first point uh, to, to make. So these arrangements, I believe, can be done in a way that doesn't disrupt trade. But the benefits we get from that, uh, I think, outweigh the challenges uh, that will come from it. Alan Zizinski from Global. Uh, one on pay deals from me, so NHS workers, for example, your ministers have in recent times spoke about wanting to go further with offers, offer more, but they're constrained because of Westminster's handling of finances. They say they don't have the economic levers. In theory, your independence plan would change that. Mm -hmm. So could you commit now to offering these workers more if you get independence? Well, I mean, obviously, individual pay negotiations, you know, and it would be actually going against the spirit of pay negotiations to sort of look, you know, a year, two, three years ahead um, and say what we would be having on the table then. But the, the, the sort of principle of your question is, is right. So right now, what is the constraint on the Scottish Government? We have effectively a fixed budget. That budget has been eroded by inflation since we set it. Uh, we don't have the ability to increase income tax mid-year, so we can't, even if we wanted to, get extra revenue uh, through that. Um, and we don't have the power to borrow for day-to-day -day expenditure. So our hands are tied. We have to fund pay deals from within the fixed and, in terms of value, uh, declining budget that we have. With independence, we will be, in a way, as previous questions have, uh, have covered, in a way that will pose its own challenges, but we will have access to all the normal economic and financial levers that other independent countries have. We will still have to make choices about, you know, do we think uh, this uh, area is more important to spend money on, uh, for the purposes of this question, public sector pay deals, uh, versus another uh, area we could spend money on. So the difficulty of the choices is still there, but we have the levers to make those choices at our own hand, rather than be constrained by decisions that are taken elsewhere. Craig Payton from PA. Uh, thanks, First Minister. Um, just to come back to the issue, say, the issue of uh, currency, um, it says here one of the criteria for moving to the Scottish pound is that Scotland is uh, fiscally sustainable. What does fiscally sustainable look like in terms of this, and, and what measures can be put in place to make sure that this transition period doesn't go on and on? Well, as I said, I, I think in response to James or, or Peter, I can't remember which one, fiscal sustainability is not about a, an overnight balancing of the budget for any country. It is about, uh, you know, assessed by the institutions that we've spoken about here, a, a central bank, the beefed up Scottish Fiscal Commission, you know, assessed by them that we are on a, a medium path to fiscal sustainability, both in terms of deficit and uh, the path of, of debt. And that would be, these would be, judgments that would be informed for Parliament, who would take the ultimate decision, uh, by the independent assessments of, of these institutions. The point we're making in this paper is that for any country, uh, being fiscally sustainable is, particularly in the times we live in right now, challenging. But as we've learned in the UK in uh, recent weeks, it is also essential. How you uh, achieve fiscal sustainability is the key choice that you have to make. We are setting out here uh, the way in which, uh, or the, the levers we would have to use borrowing responsibly, but also use the, the, the windfall of oil, oil and gas uh, with our uh, responsible borrowing powers to invest over the first decade to kickstart the growth that grows the revenues to help us on that path to fiscal sustainability. Ken Andrews from The Times. Thanks, First Minister. Uh, just to come back to Peter uh, McMahon's point, just so we don't get too confused. Um, I wondered, you talked about technology, and the paper mentions technology, improvements in technology as being the key to solving the goods crossing the border. I just wondered what kind of technology, because that was an argument we heard an awful lot from the Leave campaign in 2016, that unspecified technology would lead to border crossings. I think everyone can agree that hasn't happened. So we're not um, asking anybody to take unspecified things. We've set out uh, the uh, initial uh, analysis of what would be required in this paper. As I've said before, we will supplement that in, in future papers. But if you look at a trend across uh, the, the world right now, and the European Union itself is looking at this, the, the single trade window uh, model, uh, Norway and, and Sweden, is, I, I've used that a few times, not because it's the only example, but it's perhaps one you know, close, relatively close to home, uh, uses technology. So we will detail more uh, of this. I think 
you, you put your finger, I think, on a key point of distinction between what we are seeking to do and how those uh, who prosecuted the Brexit argument uh, went about things. Uh, you know, we've already, in these three papers, probably published infinitely more detail than was published in the entirety of the Brexit referendum. Uh, we are intent on setting out as much detail as we possibly can to inform these decisions. Ultimately, there will be, it will be a decision for people in Scotland to weigh up and to take. Uh, but uh, the process we're going through right now is intended to fully inform it. Okay, sorry, but there's no detail in there. It just says technology. Well, what I've said is we are set, we're setting out here. So we've done in this paper the analysis of uh, Scotland's trade flows, the, the services and goods distinction that I have talked about. With goods, we've got trade and goods uh, from Scotland to England. There's also, which is set out here, the additional uh, issue of goods that uh, are intended from Scotland to the international market that transit through uh, England. We set out the broad approaches uh, that other countries take uh, and we uh, and are in a process of looking at that international best practice as we design how this would work uh, for Scotland. And that will uh, be detailed that we set out um, in more depth in a future paper in the series. Uh, Alistair Grant from The Scotsman. Uh, hi, First Minister. Thanks very much. Just on the issue of borders again uh, and these, the kind of the claim that any actual physical checks be limited, likely limited to these two main trunk roads. Does that mean that there wouldn't be, as far as you're concerned, any, any other physical checks in those remaining, uh, you know, 20 something routes into Scotland? And how would you manage things like queues and backlogs in those two routes? Uh, that is what we're saying in this paper. I you know, don't want to just repeat myself of what I've already said. We're setting out in this paper uh, the broad approach that we would take, uh, which we will supplement uh, with more detail on exactly these points you're talking about later in the series. Uh, Chris McCall from the Daily Record. Hi, First Minister. Thanks very much. Um, events of recent weeks have shown how important it is for a country to have access to a central bank to protect things like pension funds, do you accept that Scotland would be at risk of market volatility for however long it relied on the Bank of England to set monetary policy? I'm not sure uh, market volatility will be a particularly effective uh, scare tactic for the, the no campaign in any future referendum, but that's just a, a, an aside before I, I come on to... Uh, the detail. The period in which we use sterling monetary policy uh, will uh, continue to be governed by the Bank of England. If that monetary policy is out of sync with Scotland's interest, then that will be one of the factors, uh, as you see in the requirements and criteria we've set out, that will determine uh, the timetable for moving to a separate uh, currency. In the period uh, where we uh, use sterling. The bank, the central bank of Scotland, uh, will have a uh, lender of last resort functions for the financial uh, sector. Um, it will uh, build up its remit as we move into a separate currency. So even in that first phase, it will require to hold uh, sterling reserves, not foreign exchange reserves. That will come uh, later, later on. Uh, Sev Carell from the Guardian. Thank you. Uh, thanks, First Minister. Just actually following on from the central bank question. So your um, paper is very clear that the central bank will be in operation functional for day one of independence. But obviously in the run-up to independence, Scotland will still be part of the UK. You've already spoken about the need for the bank to be the lender of last resort for Scotland's financial sector. It'll also have to be a funder for the Scottish government if things go wrong. And you're also saying it's going to be covering uh, all Scottish... Um, current account uh, guarantees to the level of £85,000. So I have a question, two questions which are linked. Firstly, how are you going to amass all the reserves the Scottish Central Bank needs in the period up to independence? What is the estimate for how much money you're going to need to cover all of these liabilities and guarantees are offering? And uh, there is actually a third, sorry. Do you know, as of today, what the cost of guaranteeing all Scottish current, uh, uh, current account bank holdings would be to the tune of £85,000. OK, on the, the third question, um, I, let me come back to the third question because um, I will uh, talk about the, the detail underpinning that. I probably can't give you an exact number, but I'll come back to that if we can later. Um, on the issue... so. In, as, as you see in the paper, we set out two phases uh, towards establishing, 
Scottish currency in, in phase one when we are using sterling. Uh, the central bank uh, will not require foreign exchange reserves, but it will require sterling uh, reserves to uh, you know, smooth the payment system, short-term liquidity, the lender of last resort uh, for financial institutions. And that will bring me back to your third question shortly. Um, Scotland's uh, starting uh, share of the, the population share of UK reserves uh, would be uh, on current uh, sterling dollar exchange rates uh, would be about 12 and a half billion pounds, which is uh, roughly approximate to 7% of Scotland's GDP, which I, I think, I'll, I'll be corrected if I'm wrong on this point, I think it is slightly higher a percentage of GDP than the UK currently uh, holds in, in reserves. Uh, so that would give the central bank in that initial phase uh, a sterling reserve uh, stock. As we move into... Uh, a, a Scottish pound, uh, the bank would uh, also require foreign exchange reserves. Uh, I think the Institute for uh, Government and indeed the paper sets out some of the detail in this. There is no internationally standard rule of thumb for the level of reserves uh, that is required. Different countries hold uh, different uh, value of reserves uh, as a proportion of their, their overall economy. But in that phase one, a, a central bank would build up its levels of reserve. Um, and that would be one of the requirements that would determine the timing of a shift from sterling to a Scottish pound. So Sorry. Uh, yes, when we become independent and you step, the, the central, we would start to uh, establish the central bank uh, after a vote for independence, so effectively in the transition period, so that it was operational on day one of independence. Uh, your third question, which um, the, I think the paper goes into a little bit of detail about this. Uh, obviously, the, the, the size of the Scottish banking sector is actually different to it was in 2014 because of some of the restructuring in banks uh, that have happened. So uh, Scotland has a smaller domestic banking sector now than we did then. Our banks tend to be part of bigger uh, international groups. Also, the international regulations for the capital that banks need to to hold, to mitigate themselves against uh, any financial uh, distress that they get into the Basel II regulations, uh, which we would uh, require banks here to, to deal with. So effectively what I'm saying is I don't necessarily think it is the right way of, of looking at this to say that a central bank in any country would need reserves for the totality uh, of the, the value of its banking sector, but that level of reserves would require to be proportionate to that. Um, if we are able to give you a, a figure for the, the precise question there, we'll get back to you later on. But I think it is a bit more complex, uh, as the paper sets out, than just that you know, key number. Uh, Tom Gordon from the Herald. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, First Minister. Uh, just a little bit more clarity on timescales, please. Um, I know you can't give us an exact uh, day in the calendar when we might move to a Scottish currency, but it seems you might well be able to give us a reasonable minimum estimate, given you have a lot of the preconditions set out here in terms of creating and uh, establishing <coughs> institutional infrastructure, establishing market credibility, fiscal sustainability. That sounds the, the work of several years. What's a reasonable minimum? Um, I, I'm not going to put a, a number of years on it for the very reason I think it would undermine the careful managed phase process we're setting out here and one that is overall governed by the interests of the country and the economy. Do you know? Have you worked it out? Um, but that, that's precisely my point. If we were able to work that out, then we would take a completely different approach to the one we're setting out, which is it will be guided by requirements and also criteria advised by the central bank as, as we go. For reasons that you know, I've covered in response to other questions and the, uh, the imperfection, if I can uh, use that word, of the period when we continue to use sterling, we would want that period to be as short as practicable. So we want to move to a Scottish country uh, currency as soon as is practicable. But it, by definition, if you're saying that is to be guided by objective requirements and criteria, and then you try to put a number of uh, months or years on that, then you undermine that approach. So we will follow the, uh, the, the process set out in this paper, which makes sense for the country. Well, there's an obvious follow-up question to that is, um, as Peter Smith was pointing out, you have to have an independent currency before you can join the EU. 
and you would need several years to establish the credibility of an independent currency. Now, I one of the big ticket items in this prospectus is vote for us and you can rejoin the EU. But if you can't tell us the time scale for the currency, you can't tell us the time scale for rejoining the EU either. Don't you owe voters a reasonable time frame? I, I owe voters what I'm giving them is a candid assessment of the challenges and how we will go about overcoming these challenges. Clearly, as I said to Peter, making sure uh, that these timetables uh, were aligned and, you know, People with uh, a lot of credibility on European matters have spoken before about not the, uh, the, the immaterial uh, nature of that process, but the fact that that needn't be a lengthy process. So yes, of course, we would want to ensure, and part of the reason the paper goes into such detail um, about uh, the way in which we would establish the central bank, because one of the requirements is the, not just the existence, but the credibility of the central bank. So all of these things, you're, you're absolutely right, are interlinked. Um, and that's why it's important that we set out these processes in detail. I appreciate we are uh, setting out uh, the detail today on currency. We will set out uh, in a paper coming uh, in the not too distant future, uh, some of this detail on the process for rejoining. But despite the, the centrality region. of rejoining the EU to your case for independence, you cannot give us a time frame. You can't say if it's five years, ten years, twenty years. I hope it would be uh, shorter uh, than uh, all of that. But if well, I was what, to stand here... Give us a number, then. Uh, no, I'm not. For the reasons I've set out... I, I, There's I, a minimum number. It's, it's, not my, it's not my responsibility to write your headlines. That's uh, probably not your responsibility either. Well, it's your responsibility either. to put the facts but in exactly. front of voters. You're and not I'm doing putting, it, are you? I'm putting facts in front of voters. I'm setting out a responsible uh, process that which we would go through to meet that objective of Scotland back in the European Union. And remember, independence is the only route for Scotland back into the European Union. Uh, Michael Blackley from the Daily Mail. Thank you. Um, you spent quite a lot of time in the 2014 independence campaign um, arguing against exactly the currency policies that you've set out today. So why were you wrong then? and right now, and is it still the case, as you said then, that businesses are going to face quite considerable extra costs in England and Scotland as a result of having a different currency from our biggest trading partner? Um, I, I don't think we were wrong in 2014. I think a currency union would have been a perfectly legitimate, valid, um, and I think it would have turned out to be an effective uh, currency option for Scotland to have pursued. But if you recall, uh, the, not just the UK government, but all of the main parties effectively vetoed it in the 2014 referendum. I think at the time, if memory serves me correctly, probably supported uh, by the, the Daily Mail. So uh, we're not going to put uh, Scotland's uh, future uh, position into a, a place where it can be vetoed uh, by a Westminster establishment. So we are setting out a sensible process uh, for establishing a, a currency. And, you know, if, if you listen sometimes to uh, people in the opposition, they would have you believe that Scotland is the only country in the face of the planet that can't have uh, a currency uh, arrangement that works effectively, which is, you know, patent nonsense. And I think you did say £500 million a year of costs for businesses in 2014. Is that still the I, case? I would never want to suggest that the Daily Mail would, would misquote me, and I'm not suggesting you are, but I'm not sure what you're quoting. If you'd send that to me later on, I'm happy to give you a response uh, to it. Uh, Chris Green from the AI. Thank you, First Minister. Um, given how much of this depends um, on sort of negotiations with the UK government post a yes vote at the EU, would it not be a sensible um, thing to do to, to commit to a confirmatory vote on the terms of the deal afterwards? So proposed to say no exactly, not just what you're proposing now, but what is actually agreed after that period? No, we're going to, you know, stick to the uh, precedent from 2014. The way, you know, these uh, things in terms of constitutional referendums are, are normally done. I will leave it to others who uh, think an, an alternative approach uh, would be appropriate to argue that. I think this is the right way to proceed uh, to ask people in Scotland uh, whether they want to be independent or not, uh, and to furnish uh, them with the information uh, to underpin that choice, and, and that is what we're seeking to do. Uh, Dan Sanderson from The Telegraph. Uh, thanks very much, First Minister. Um, yeah, just to follow up on what Tom was saying, given you've accepted that Scotland couldn't rejoin the EU until it had its own currency, do you accept that that means that Scotland would face you know, an undefined period, potentially a decade or more, outside of both the UK and the EU? Um, and also, 
given the difficulties with all of this, why, and you, you're clearly a big believer in the EU, why not just join the Euro? What is it about that that you don't like? Thank you. I, I don't think, put, put aside my preferences uh, for one minute, I don't think Scotland would uh, qualify uh, automatically to join the Euro, so that is, um, but I don't think it is uh, the right uh, option for, for Scotland. You, I think, if, if I may say so, I think in your question there, you took an enormous leap of, of logic. I've set out why, it, in terms of currency, as we will set out on European Union with respect to the negotiation process, we're not going to put, at this stage, definitive timelines on that. But that does not take you to what you said there in terms of a timeline. We want these processes to be as short uh, as possible for obvious reasons and you know, have confidence that they can be uh, short periods of time. Uh, and I would you know, repeat a point I've already made. Uh, there is no other route back into the EU uh, other than Scotland being independent. So yes, there will be a process that we have to go through to achieve that, uh, but that is compared to the alternative of a permanent existence outside the EU, which is what we will have if we remain part of the UK. So, uh, sorry, Rachel. just to follow up on that, um, just, so, just so I'm clear, if Scotland was using a foreign country's currency, it, wouldn't be, it might be able to apply to join the EU, but it wouldn't we, be able we, to formally join it. Do you, do we, you we want to establish a Scottish currency. Incidentally, sterling is not a foreign currency. Uh, sterling is Scotland's currency. It is as much our currency as it is any other part of the UK. This is not, would not be Scotland using uh, another country's currency. It would be Scotland continuing to use our own cu currency, an internationally traded uh, currency, into the bargain. But for all the reasons I set out, including the issues that have been raised around the European Union, we want, as soon as practicable, to move to a Scottish pound because we think that would be the overall interest of the economy. Uh, Rachel Watson from The Sun. Um, just again on currency, um, it says here that the Scottish pound would be Scotland's legal currency, but people would be able to use sterling or other currencies after making that change. How would that work and what other currencies are you talking about here? That, that's just a statement of, of fact, uh, what people can do right now. I, I don't uh, believe that when Scotland has its own pound, uh, people would choose that, but people can choose to trade in uh, different currencies uh, right now. So that's no uh, more than just a statement of uh, fact and reality. Uh, Hamish Morrison from The National. Um, quite a lot of this uh, document seems to be kind of predicated on what you've called a positive and respectful working relationship with Westminster uh, during the negotiation period. Um, what are your reasons for optimism <laughs> for that? <laughs> That's a very good question, actually. Um, I think when Scotland is independent and we have a relationship of equals, um, as I said in, in my speech to the SNP conference last week, I do think that transforms the, the relationship both in spirit and um, in detail. And, you know, certainly... You know, as is the case right now, notwithstanding political differences, is the way we try to approach uh, a relationship with the UK government. I think the whole uh, basis of that will be different when Scotland is independent in that partnership of equals. But you're right, any relationship uh, takes two to make it work. And I hope uh, when Scotland is independent, we have a, a UK government that is much more conducive to good, uh, positive partnership working. And lastly, I think unless there is any journalist that hasn't had the chance to ask a question, uh, Kirsteen Patterson from Holyrood. Thanks, First Minister. Can I ask, if the Supreme Court comes back and says, no, it does not agree with the Scottish Government's case, um, are you still committed to fighting the next general election as a de facto independence referendum? Uh, the position I set out to Parliament in June, uh, I think it was, hasn't changed. So let me be clear on that. Uh, that said, you know, the Supreme Court is... Uh, currently considering its uh, judgment following the hearing last week, um, I don't think there is any point, um, and it's probably not even appropriate for me to speculate on the outcome of the Supreme Court. I think it is fair to say, once we have the Supreme Court's judgment, and I hope it will be positive, but I don't know, uh, once we have the Supreme Court's judgment, I'm pretty certain I'll be standing here answering all of these questions in some detail at that point. I will deal with that eventuality. I'm not in control of that. I, I hope there's a general election very soon because I want this rotten shower um, of, of a government, I, I hope, uh, out of office. Uh, but I am not in control of that. And uh, I will deal with these things as and when they, they happen. Part of the 
the challenge, but part of the responsibility in government uh, and in politics generally is to deal with situations as they develop. So, uh, again, if and when that happens, no doubt I'll be back here, or maybe not in here if it's an election, uh, answering those questions in detail. Did I miss anybody? This is not an invitation for second goes, or third goes, or fourth goes in some uh, cases, naming no names. Um, thank you all very much indeed.